Hello and welcome to our Legacy 23 Coaches panel where we will discuss leadership in the modern era and we have a truly outstanding international panel joining us. Emma Hayes, head coach at Chelsea Women's FC joins us from England. Tony Gustafsson, head coach of the Westfield Matildas comes in from Sweden and Melissa Andretta, assistant coach of the Westfield Matildas is up bright and early in Queensland and Sarah Walsh, head of Women's World Cup Legacy Football Australia in Sydney. Good morning, good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been such a fraught year for everyone with COVID-19. Everyone's been working very hard to ensure that football survives and of course thrives in many areas. So Emma Hayes, if we start with you, the UK is kind of starting to emerge from COVID-19 lockdown. Yes. How are you? Well, I'm even better knowing Sam Kerr's had a bit of sunshine the last couple of days because <laughs> um, it's been, I think, for, for all of us worldwide, a, a really, really challenging time. But uh, especially for a team that's that's playing and in season, and there's always that assumption that because we're at work and because we have the outlet to be able to get up and do our job every day, that we don't face the same struggles and, and challenges. And, and the realities are that uh, this is the first time in my coaching career I've ever had to face yeah, unprecedented challenges with dealing with the the emotional and mental well-being of of my players for, for some that haven't seen their family for some more than 12 months so it's been been a really really challenging time so emma what does a normal day look like for you uh me getting up do mummy duties in the morning i've got to take care of that and get all of that done before quarter to nine and then i get on the road get in team meetings pretty much straight away from when I'm in then a session then different sessions throughout the day maybe meetings analysis whatever it might be through, throughout the day but uh, the the biggest thing I think is that we're no longer doing anything the same way so we don't eat lunches together anymore our team meetings are only 15 minutes you can't stay in a space for too long so I've had to really find different ways to to work with people knowing that we don't have the same close contact that, that teams are so used to having. So uh, COVID, I'm so happy, as everybody is, to, to hopefully see an end to, to COVID and um, miss the fans. Weird playing football without fans. I think for anybody it is. But uh, grateful that we've come through this period and, and nobody has been too damaged from it, even though a lot of my team has had covid uh, during the Christmas period, we've all recovered and thankfully nobody has, has, has been de dealing with the ramifications of it. Yeah, trying times indeed. You mentioned your young son, so you're busy at home as well. Yeah. If we checked in with you at, say, 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, where would we find you? You would find me in the office at that point because we're training on a Saturday. We play on Sundays. But um, I used to take my little one to work with me on Saturdays. That was his day with the team. And he hasn't had that for COVID. So a lot of my players who have got used to, to him being around and vice versa, uh, I feel like my time with him has been, uh, I've had to be smarter about that time, knowing that uh, I probably have one day or less where I don't have, have that opportunity to be with him. And he doesn't come on the road with me anymore. So that all of that has been a change and a challenge for me as a, as a parent um, because in fact my son actually went through a period of time where he developed a stammer when I started going back to work the trauma of me having to go back to work I think was was quite a struggle for him but that that, that for me has been the, the mental thing about COVID with women what I have noticed see that happened with my son but with the athletes what I've seen is elongated period with period cycles so women and their menstrual cycles have been longer uh, in between because of, uh, I'm actually spending some time at the moment trying to understand what it is that are lengthening period cycles and that link to, to the pandemic. That's been an interesting finding in this period. Wow. COVID has a no lot to answer for. <laughs> uh, Emma, Chelsea's sitting top of the table. Uh, what in your career so far makes you most proud? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Someone asked me this question the other day about uh, the final last year in the Continental Cup, and I, and I hate to even admit this, but whenever we've won something, I never enjoy it as much as I did the journey. So as much as you, I think, oh, it's the final, you get there, I feel relief 
always at the end of it. But the thing I enjoy the most is the relationships I build with players. You know, just the challenge of trying to get the best out of them or finding finding the right way from that's probably the part of the job I enjoy the most. The part I least enjoy is probably when they drive me mad on the same end, when they can be equally annoying. So it's quite a juxtaposition that, but no, I'm grateful. I've had a great career, well journeyed and I've got a fantastic team. We've got a Champions League game Wednesday night. So I'm really looking forward to this next uh, stage. Well, I think Tony Gustafsson could probably relate to a lot of that. Tony, how are things in Sweden at the moment? It's good. Uh, Emma mentioned some sunshine. We actually had a couple of days with really good sun now. Oh, that's a, that's a plus. Now, you'd love to be travelling around the world, visiting all your players, but we have to be patient, of course. What does your normal routine look like at the moment? Well, question is if there is any normal anymore, you know, what's the new <laughs> normal? Um, it is a very different situation uh, today. Uh, if possible, I would have visited a lot of clubs to establish a relationship with club coaches like Emma and so forth and meet players and, and see players and establish this personal re relationship and have meetings and talks over a coffee. But I have to do the best of the situation and try to find different solutions to it. Uh, this is one way, meaning video conferences and, and video talks or e-coffees, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> to connect that way. Uh, and then I spend a lot of time watching games and watching players. Obviously, being new at the at the role, not even two months uh, as a head coach for the Matildas, I need to go get updated as soon as I can to watch as many games as possible. Um, but I, I think there's no normal days. Every day looks different uh, for me. And a weekend? Weekends different. Uh, what what are you up to on a Saturday morning? I'd say it depends on if it's Saturday morning Australian time or Swedish <laughs> time. <laughs> but I'd say if it's Swedish uh, mornings, I most likely watch a game that have already been played in Australian time uh, to catch up on those ones. And then I'll try to look at some European games after that. And then after that, I try to get some... I talk a lot about getting one day better and I need to get one day better physically uh, to be able to do the best job possible as a coach. I spend a lot of time by the computer and on the phone and in order to, to be energized and, and be, be as good as possible as a coach, I need to invest in myself a little bit more than I normally do. So I try also on a Saturday to get a power walk in. Um, so that's kind of the Saturdays. Well, Tony, you also have so many achievements already in your career. What do you reflect on most proudly? Well, I, th I think using the word achievement, I think a lot of people would reference results uh, and think, you know, you, you won something. And, and obviously, I'm proud to have won different things. But Emma is actually touching on the same thing that I'm most proud of, meaning all the people that you get the privilege to work with, staff and players, and, and the, the relationship that you get to, to establish. And what's I'm, what I'm really passionate about leadership is to, to see, can I help contribute to help an individual or a team reach their full potential? and see them take off. And, and I call it breakthrough coaching. Can I help to, to get a player or a team to break through and really reach their full potential? That's, you know, and then obviously you have some players in the back of your mind and some teams in the back of your mind, but those relationships and being able to help other people reach their full potential, that's what I'm most proud of. Well, someone you'll be working with is Mel Andriata. Mel, it's a bit warmer where you are. How are things in Queensland? You're right. It is um, just after 6.30. I've lost track of time and it is steaming. It's already a warm 28 degrees. So Queensland sunshine, hey? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, hopefully in the not too distant future, you'll actually be working in person side by side with, with Tony in the Westfield Matildas role. Uh, tell me, what does your routine look like at the moment? Yeah, it is a, a bit different being out of camp. Um, typically, it starts with doing something, um, you know, energetic. Tony just alluded to it. But it's important, you know, you can be at your desk um, for hours in meetings, on calls, um, planning things, but starting the day with energy. Yeah, well, that sounds like a perfect plan. Uh, and you've had a, a wonderful career so far as well. And we spent a lot of time seeing you in and around the W League. Uh, where would we find you now on a weekend? Uh well, Saturday mornings could be watching um, some games, um, but my nephew's just started all himself, so it is cute watching four-year-olds run around. 
<laughs> that's cute when it's still all about that having fun. <laughs> Sarah yeah. Walsh in Sydney, there's been Great. no rest for you since the announcement of the hosting rights for the World Cup 2023. What does your regular routine look like and where are you at 10 o'clock on a Saturday? Good question, Steph. Um, uh, last week, uh, last Saturday, I was flying back from Brisbane. We had a, a pretty exciting um, Indigenous event up there. So if I'm not travelling, uh, I'm coming back from a spin class that, um, you know, due to COVID, everything's um, been challenging. You actually have to uh, book your sessions in a week before. So if I'm lucky enough to actually book it, I'll bet you'll find me at spin. Um, you know, spinning the legs around very slowly these days. But uh, <laughs> I like to do brunch uh, with my partner. Uh, Saturdays are for rest, really, if I'm not working. So, yeah. Well, you're making, all of you making me sound very, very lazy because I would still probably be trying to wake up at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. <laughs> uh, today, ladies and gents, we're talking about modern leadership. Uh, Emma Hayes, how would you describe your leadership style? Oh, that's a really good question. And one that I think uh, has probably changed from when I very started, started early on in my career to now, in as much as personality doesn't change but how you learn to manage, I think this, the, the different elements of the job come with experience. Um, that, that for me is probably the one big thing. I would say I'm calm. Um, I'm somebody who will always listen. I'll be reflective all the time of what people are saying to me, whether it be staff, whether it be players, um, and then work on, as I said, always trying to do the right things at the right time. Like that, I don't, I think it's a job where no one, not the same, the same thing doesn't happen all of the time. You could have a day of, of unbelievable joy and the following day it could feel like a crisis in this profession. And that, that crisis can be momentary. It could be a, a situation of, I don't know, somebody's not handling, not being in the starting lineup or not uh, necessarily agreeing with something that might have been set out for them. So I think you're always constantly dealing with the ebb and the flow that takes place within group dynamics. So I always think staying the course, being consistent but fair uh, are two main uh, tenants of the job. And I think uh, within that leadership is to constantly think about uh, how you're gonna drive the bus as I describe it. <laughs> uh, but sometimes recognizing when you need to have your headphones on and keep driving versus taking it off and listening to the right things uh, in the right moments. But certainly a job I have learned more often than not from the mistakes, from the failures, from the disappointments, from the learnings from the players. I learn significantly from players about what their needs are and, and always from good people around me and my staff. And the way your style has changed over the years, do you put that down to more experience or uh, wisdom with years? Mm. I think probably a combination of them. I think if you're going to become a skilled surgeon or a, a pilot or a teacher, they more often than not come from the number of times you've done something. But that doesn't automatically in itself mean that you're going to be great at something just because you've done it a number of times. It's about how you constantly look to refine and improve a process again and again and again. And I think that's what professionalism is. And maybe even in the more, maybe even the last five, six years of my career, I've really understood that professionalism are standards. And that the more professional you get, the better your standards get. And as I said to one of my young players yesterday, being the best player isn't the most talented, it's being the most consistent. And it's being the most consistent in what you do every day instead of having just constant highs where I will do this, I'm going to do that. And all of a sudden, a week later, you show up late for something. It's just more often than not doing the basics well all of the time. The fundamentals, I think, are what did differentiate the best, the great from the good. And that's probably what I've learned a lot about myself, about how if I want to maintain a level uh, to keep improving people. I have to make sure the double standard, as I always call it, is not 
pointed back at me. I have to always be the the flag bearer uh, if I want if I want anybody to follow suit with that. So if you had to pinpoint a characteristic that mm. every leader sh should have, would you put professionalism then at the top? I'd put consistency there. I would definitely put that word, you know, you can talk about disciplines, you can talk about ambition and competitive, you know, all of those elements, I'm, I'm all of those. But consistency for me is one that is so underestimated and yet so hard to achieve. Tony, I'm sure a lot of that resonates with you. How would you describe your leadership style? I would like to pass that on to someone else to answer what I am as a leader, that's better, <laughs> but if you force me to answer, yeah, I think some of the words that have been thrown at me through the years is that I'm very passionate. Um, I'm passionate about two things, especially one, people. Uh, I always say I work with people first and players second. I, I'm a teacher by degree as well and worked in schools. And, and I see myself as a coach. I see myself as a teacher as well to help people reach their full potential. Uh, but I'm also very passionate about the, the game, which I call the, the green field of chess. So I think passion is, is one thing. Um, Another thing in my leadership is um, I have this saying I talk about one day better. I think my leadership is all about creating an environment where I myself show that I always want to be one day better, but also have people around me and a team that always want to get one day better. And what I've seen throughout the years is what really different um, stars from average, so to speak, is the ones that has that, that inner drive of always wanting to improve, always wanting to wake up to get one day better, not just one day older. So I think that resonates with my leadership a lot. You mentioned your teaching background, and I know that education is something that runs through your family as well. So you have been inured into it from an early age. Is that something that you've used uh, to refine your style over the years? I definitely think I've, I've had a passion for teaching for a long time. I started as a substitute teacher when I was 18 years old uh, and, and I wanted to get into that profession. And then obviously with a passion to football, I can combine teaching and the passion for the game, which, which suits me perfect. I think what, what I have evolved throughout the years is that I have started to, to simplify things. I think I went to that trap that a lot, a lot of young coaches do, and I did, meaning I was over ambitious. I wanted to do everything, and I threw everything at everyone, and you know, you want to do so much. And I think being over ambitious and complicate stuff, sometimes you shoot over the target, and you just need to. I think there's an Einstein quote saying, if you can't explain it simple, you don't know it well enough. And I think I'm starting to know it well enough now to simplify things. Uh, so I think in that terms, I've, I've developed as a coach for sure. Emma spoke to consistency. What's the characteristic that you would uh, put, put as the, the one thing that every leader should possess? I got an advice some years ago that has really stuck with me, and that's be true to who you are. I think every leader has to really be true to who you are so it's not copy-paste from someone else. There's some leadership strategies that everyone needs to have, but you need to be true to yourself. So that, that's one thing. The other one for me that is big is belief. Um, you have to, as a leader, you have to believe in the people you work with and love them for who they are, but see them for who they can become. So they feel that you see the potential within them to have them you know, being passionate about getting one day better and grow as people and as a team. So I think belief is definitely believe in the people and their passion to help other people, I think is definitely a key, key aspect of leadership. Mel, how about you? Uh, your leadership style, uh, we've seen you in, in various roles. How would you sum your style up? Uh, I think you just sort of alluded to it. I'd probably say one word, adaptive. <laughs> <laughs> Adaptive and it's proven, um, you know, proven me well or in a good position through COVID where problems are constantly arising there. The problems are always different and the solutions generally aren't known. So being adaptive, um, you know, you can mobilise people, look at things differently, look, at, uh, look for trends um, to, to find a solution or a way forward and, I think in, in my career and, and where I've been, I think that adaptability has um, put me in good stead. And do you think that adaptability means that you change your style or you just uh, create a situation where you'll adapt for that moment? 
Yeah, good, good question. <laughs> I don't, I certainly don't change my personality uh, at all. Uh, but yeah, you have to, each team, each person is different and they need different things from you. They need different things um, to, to uh, thrive. And it's finding, as you know, Emma and uh, Tony have both said, what's that, what's that thing you can do or um, environment you can create to, to spark them, um, staff and, and players. So um, it's being adaptable and, and finding what is, is best for your team and for your people. Mel, you spoke to the need to adapt during COVID-19 times. What do you think is the biggest challenge that leaders have faced during this pandemic period? Yeah, I, I actually think when we're such a, I think we're a people sport and, and want to be together, that isolation um, has been massive and, and the subsequent mental health or, or well-being um you know concerns that, that come from that and and how we can actually still be together though apart is the challenge uh for us as leaders and um people in our organizations to to find a way to stay connected and i'd say that's been the biggest challenge and and for us in the national team obviously you know that leans towards performance preparation uh how we can still move forward and, and prepare, even though we're, we're even more disconnected than, than usual. Yeah, Emma, you spoke to that before about that uh, inability to be really close uh, to people in a, in a personal situation. Has that been your biggest challenge and how does that affect how you lead a new generation of players and staff through these times? Yeah, I, I don't think I really realised it until after a few months had passed when, when pre-season had kicked off because everybody had to do all their prehab and everything two metres apart, outside, no one was in the changing room and we went through probably three or four months of this whole process of everybody preparing themselves for games or training, then in small groups, then not allowed to change bibs, not allowed to high five, not allowed to be conscious of your, where your drinks are. The whole thing, we'd almost dehumanised um, the process. And it's not like you're conscious of it, but all of a sudden time had passed and you, you'd fast realised that some were slipping through the gap, that... Not only were they coming into trading every day, almost isolated in the team, but they're then going home isolated. Yeah. And, and I think some of the, 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 the psychological impact that had hasn't really sort of come through until now. And you realize that I might have some players on my team whose form haven't been very good, but it's been really, really difficult to change it because this is not as simple as connecting the dots around, uh, I don't know, improving something around their technical or their tactical play, or even that it might be an issue off the pitch that you can solve. We're talking about something you can't solve in terms of, one player described it to me as, if I could go home, even if I knew I could go home, but, uh, but I didn't go, I, I would settle with that. Yeah, but because I know I can't go, I, it, this feels claustrophobic. I feel trapped. And imagine what that does on a daily basis and the impact it has. Um, that's been really difficult to manage as a coach because how do you then manage somebody who is in that place uh, and you have to get them to focus on the controllables, but you know that they all they need is to see their family and, and that's what they, they're craving and you can't do much about it. So it's been really, really tough, to be honest. Yeah, really a uh, tricky situation. Mm -hmm. Tony, for yeah. you, you're charged with leading this generation of players into a home World Cup and, and you haven't been able to get together with them personally. But has that also created for you an opportunity where you're actually spending perhaps one-on-one -on -one time, even though it's virtually? Has that given a different sort of opportunity? It's definitely a way to look at it. And I, Mel touched upon this, and I have to credit Mel and the coaches in the Matildas about this, because we talked about what, what is normal. And I think with a COVID situation, you can tend to go, well, we can't do what we normally do. You know, we've always done it this way. Now we can't do it that way. And that comfort is, is challenging. You know, you, you get out of your comfort zone and now you have to think differently. You have to think outside of the box. And 
if you're strong enough and 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 at a moment I am because I'm energized to being in, in a new job here and and then I choose to look at it exactly the way you asked meaning an opportunity to take advantage of the thing that could be an advantage in this for example we had a canceled camp uh, now in February we couldn't we couldn't join it was a disappointment for all of us we could have sat nine days whining about not having a camp. We could have used it as an excuse to say, we can't get together. We can't perform in the Olympics. This is a disaster. Or we can say, okay, what is it that we can use to our advantage now? That means we can work more on individual stuff. We don't have to taper the practice to, to games. They don't have to travel. Maybe the clubs like Emma, for example, you get a fresher player because if they get nine days, they can get a couple of days off. Then maybe a couple of double sessions, work on the physical aspect of the game, maybe some individual one we ones and so forth. So definitely I'm trying to look at it as an advantage. Would I like to have an assembly? Would I like to be the players on the pitch? Of course. As, as a national team coach, you're probably always going to think you don't have enough time on the pitch with the players. But I do choose to look at it as a, as a what can I use to my advantage? And one thing is I can spend more time on one-on-one -on -one with players like this, but I can also spend more time on planning and watching games and really make sure that I, I have a good insight on every player's individual skills to put it together to a team. Well, Tony, part of what we're talking about today is a legacy and Legacy 23 particularly. What's your definition of legacy and, and how do you want to work towards that? That's a huge question you're asking me. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, legacy in 23, it's, it, first of all, it's much, much bigger than me. It's not about Tony Gustafsson being a head coach for the Matildas. I'm just happy to play a small part of a much, much bigger legacy. Um, I would love us to leave the game better than when it was when we arrived. So can we have that mindset of always getting one day better as an individual, as a staff, as a team, and the game as a whole, you know, and... By doing that, maybe we as a staff can empower players uh, to perform and succeed. And if they do that, maybe we can help them build a platform and a stage where their voices can be heard uh, and they can then influence the game in their own way uh, if we give them a platform to do that. So the legacy for me, it's, it's not just about the result. Do we want to win every game in the World Cup on home? So of course we want to do that, but that's a smaller mean to a bigger end. The legacy for me is it's more, more than that. Tony, you've been uh, in your career supported by a number of women as well as men and uh, perhaps something that you are keen on doing is encouraging more women uh, into coaching. Uh, what sort of initiatives do you think could be made to help that happen? I have complete trust in, in the process and the plans that the Federation have presented to me. There's a lot of, of uh, work going on and that's been done even before I arrived. And one of the reasons why I'm here now is I really believe in those processes. Um, Sarah is definitely part of that process and having introduced me to it. So I think those specific uh, initiative to the local market, uh, people have much better understanding the, I, than I do in terms of the specifics. What I hope I can contribute is to not lead, but inspire, you know, can I inspire to create more inclusive environments to support learning that where we can learn from each other. For example, I've learned a lot and I'm really appreciative for all the talks that I've had with Mel, with Ray, with Leah, with Sarah, I even had a fantastic meeting with the Matilda alumni to hear about the history and the tradition about the, the program. So for me, if I can share my experience from from what i've experienced i wouldn't be where i am today if it wasn't for very strong women leaders that have put me in the place where i am today both when it comes to my family but my grandmas my mom my partner my sister and so forth they're role models and helped me a lot when it comes to leadership and teaching but also in terms of coaches you know uh, i've learned a lot working with jill in the us uh, a lot uh, and especially the one thing i talked about you know believe in your staff and believe in your player he was amazing when it comes to that, really delegate and believe and get people around you to, to grow. So if I can contribute in that and inspire uh, the next generation of leaders to really follow their passion about leadership, I would love to help in a small part that I can. Well, Mel, you're someone that's uh, come through uh, various initiatives to help women uh, perhaps be lifted up in coaching and feel supported. Uh, what more do you think could be done to help more women be involved in that sort of space and perhaps not even at the elite level, but just in general, wanting and being able to coach? Uh, I have been very fortunate to be a part of a lot of those programs. And I think those programs 
can exist in states, um, in local communities. Um, and one as simple as, you know, um, the FFA female mentor program was excellent for me. And, and sometimes um, a young mom or sister or auntie like me who's watching their four-year-old might be the best person to take the team. But the challenge is um, the perception of people in clubs and of our community of a mother or an auntie or a sister wanting or, or willing um, or able to, to do the job. I think um, in, in our local clubs, in our communities, still challenging the perception of who can be a coach and what a coach uh, looks like. Um, how we do that, it's, it's lifting up more women and, and approaching women to be involved in these clubs and, and in our programs and, and making it normal that we're equally um, capable of being excellent um, as coaches, administrators, um, officials, um, whatever role it might be that uh, you love in, in the game. I think that could help. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Sarah, it's something you're very passionate about. Where does that sit in the Legacy 23 plan? Yeah, thanks, Steph. Um, there's a lot of work we need to do in this space, and I'll just throw some stats out to start with. Um, it's roughly 5% of our advanced accredited coaches are female. Uh, women, um, C, B, uh, A and pro licence, um, we really need to move that number. Um, and there's, there's a number of things we need to do to be able to do that. There's a lot of research out there around, you know, uh, quotas for coaching courses, um, you know, programs like the Female Mentor Program we run. We're running a, a campaign at the moment called Female Football Week. So it's not one thing that will work. It's a, it's a whole number of, and range of things. Um, but, you know, you look back at, um, I look back at a program we run three years ago and, you know, we didn't run it for a long time, but, you know, profiling women um, and creating that visibility for the, the number of women at the community level, because unless we build the base, you know, the, the top end's not, it's like the playing pyramid, right? You need a bigger base. So we have 30,000 um, 30, plus community coaches um, only 10 to 15 percent of females so you know we just need to be creative and try new things and we're going to get a lot of things wrong but there's a high percentage of women who are actually teaching in schools here so that might be a really great start let's go to where the women are you know Tony's talked about uh, his teaching um, degree having a really great influence over his ability to coach and, and lead people so it sounds like a really great place for us to start targeting um, coaches so you know, um, it's not that women aren't confident. It's it, They're being overlooked uh, plenty of times within their community clubs. It's about education, um, ca capacity building for our 2,500 plus community clubs. Um, and leading back to this whole discussion around legacy, um, we have a massive opportunity to utilise this event in 2023. That, that will be my role with a, a massive team here. We're working with the federal government. Uh, we do not want to lose this opportunity to really shift the dial and accelerate the change. Um, the conversations have been really good, um, but we, re we really think that we can, you know, try to get to gender equality by 2027. Um, and in this space, that means that more women having access, more women having access to support programs. Um, it, I think it's the Federation's role to start to remove barriers. We understand what those barriers are, you know. Things like, uh, I'll give an example, and it's not for a lack of trying in some areas. We put out a coaching conference and, um, you know, only a number of women will, will either register or turn up. We go back and think about the advertising. How do we advertise this coaching conference? Um, have we previously put out photos of similar coaching conferences where there's mostly men? And, you know, sometimes you see these things and it's like, well, actually, was that a men's conference or was that a women's? So, uh, we've really just got to review our practices um, and try, just try. Uh, this is a space, a safe space where we actually need to just trial things. If they don't work, we change it. Uh, we're, we're kind of bouncing around the idea at the moment of for coaching co conferences and for all coaching licenses, we might just reserve 25% for women. Just see what happens. It might actually signal to women that one, you won't be alone on the call. And two, we want you there. Um, and these things are really important, us signalling to women and, and really making sure that um, they're receiving the message that we want them in the game. So, you know, we might trial that. Uh, Queensland are running a female-only um, coaching course at the moment. We'll trial that. 
Um, so it's all these different levers we're going to pull over the next, you know, six years to make sure that um, we do leave a legacy through hosting this event. Emma, a lot of that discussion is around inclusion, uh, isn't it? And I know that uh, where you're from, only a very tiny percentage of players actually stay in the game and stay involved in the game to the elite level. How do we work with inclusion to keep women from different, say, socioeconomic or geographic backgrounds in the game? You know what? I think Sarah alluded to it. It's like it's multifaceted. It's, it's not... Uh, it's not one thing over another. It's it's everything from the top of the pyramid, like coaching courses, changing their content uh, to in, to to actually acknowledge that women play football. And it's for I mean, you think about the number of coaching courses you go on, and the references to the women's game is like zero point zero percent. So we need to change that uh, narrative. I think with regards to branding, marketing. And, and how we promote uh, opportunities within the sport have to be reflected within the, the federation. I think there'll probably have to be uh, coaching spaces set aside, even bursaries, grants, because more often than not, women in football aren't uh, necessarily coming from the men's professional game where they can afford often expense and childcare can be a rationale for while women won't proceed through the steps and the ladder. Some won't step into it because, because it might be they're the only females going through it. And actually, if you, Sarah, if you haven't connected with uh, Audrey Cooper from England, someone who's doing a really good job of that here to, to create uh, and mentor female coaches all the way through. And I think England in general have, have done a lot of work from Kelly Simmons in, in this area in the last five, 10 years to really uh, normalize that. And then you get situations like you do when I came into the league, I was probably, there were only two women in charge of the league and charge of teams in the league. Now out of 12 teams, I think we got eight female leaders. So it, 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 the knock-on effect takes a little bit of time. Well, did, does that come as a result of success of England at national team? Maybe, you know what I mean? It's it's the whole it's the whole thing. and. Um, and I think women being able to, to be strong in the right moments. I know I have intentionally and deliberately put myself on uh, a little bit of a edge of the a pirate ship at times, because you have to take risks when you're in my position to set the standard and say, no, we want more or, or demand more. I think Mel, that may fall at your doorstep. There'll come that opportunity. And you can already see with Tony's been around enough wonderful females and, and, and especially fantastic leaders like Jill to be able to bring some of, I think, one of the, some of the wonderful things from the US to Australia. He would have been exposed to that. And he comes from the most equal nation in the world. And I've got enough Swedes on my team to know that. So I think the combination of all of those things can create dynamite for you guys in the next few years on top of the Matildas you know having a good showing uh, in, a, in a home competition where you're actually going to get the exposure and, and like Tony said it goes beyond just winning the football match of course that's important but it's everything around it I think what you will put in place now uh, will really start to take effect I think come the end of that World Cup. Emma, what did your journey look like? Uh, why did you get into coaching and who helped you through? When I think about that now, I think I don't know how I made it, to be quite honest with you, because I didn't have any support. I, I, I felt like I had every door shut in my face, even while I was doing my licences here. I was definitely England back in the, the late 90s wasn't a welcoming place in terms of the football community for women. There wasn't any professional sport, so I left and went to the Amer to America, and I feel like I've lived my life with rose-tinted spectacles because, I, as far as I'm concerned, as an English woman, I've lived in America where I think, oh well, doesn't matter, I, everything's equal here, and 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 it felt like that as a young twenty-something. I, I had ten years in in and out of America, and what I learned was that that knowing I was whatever I was being given uh, an equality of opportunity for something built my confidence and belief 
It's not to say I fouled many times in it, but because I always knew I would be able to get a door open somewhere. By the time I came back into England in 2012, it felt like I was returning to the Victorian ages. Like England in 2012 in the women's football world was so dinosaur world in many worlds. So I took all that spirit, mentality, the energy, the learnings from America and, and brought it to the UK and influenced so much of my colleagues, my peers, et cetera. And I think my journey as a coach, my, it's for sure hasn't been a straight down the middle one. It's been journeyed all over the place. And I think because of that and that exposure, whether it's coaching boys teams, college teams, semi-pro team, pro teams, whatever that might be, that makeup. I think that's certainly taught me an awful lot that you are responsible for your resilience. You are responsible for making sure that, yes, it's been much more difficult for women in coaching, but, you know, you've got to you get your headphones on and put your feet on the bus and you've got to plough forward because there will be scores of women behind that are, uh, you know, want to see that. Like like Sarah said before, in order to get, let's say, mums or teacher, female teachers into the profession of coaching, they need to see others doing it. That's the most important thing. So I think, you know, the, the important part of having homegrown coaches in and around Tony is crucial because it's important for Australian women to see that, that, that you know, they've got their own at the very top. So Mel, that's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty broad. I've been in you the gym. It. I can handle it. <laughs> Is that something though that really resonates with you? What Emma's experience was and uh, how Tony talks about wanting to help support women through coaching? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as Emma, Emma spoke, um, the journey sounded quite similar, especially through the, the coaching licenses, the badges. Last year, I coached senior men. Um, the number of times I approached the venue and I was the strapper, I was the physio, um, <laughs> I was the team manager, I was everything but the coach. Um, but on the flip side, um, you know, I have been supported by so many strong women um, within our organisation, um, just you know, as you're walking down the tunnel, someone from the media, my mum is outstanding. Um, my grandmother, uh, grandmothers, strong, you know, um, I guess they describe themselves or my grandmother did as the smiling ox. So you can be really strong like an ox is, but you can be kind and, and, and that's good. You don't have to be any other way. Um, and I think those little things I, I take with me and I hope, um, you know, in my role, I can, I can help and others or uplift others, uh, you know, to get the same opportunity or, or leave, you know, a clearer path um, for them with, with more support. Uh, because if it wasn't for those people around me and those opportunities afforded to me, um, I wouldn't be here now either. A couple of years ago on International Women's Day in uh, in Australia, there was the tagline, uh, if she can see it, she can be it. Or if you're averse, that you can't be what you can't see. This year, it's choose to challenge. Uh, Mel, what does International Women's Day mean to you? Celebrating the achievements of women, uh, you know, their contribution to, to making a difference. And um, there's so many wonderful, strong, um, high achieving, um, giving women in our game, sport in particular, who probably fly under the radar and, and celebrating everything that they do, um, all their contributions, I think is important. And what advice do you give the young women if they want to choose to challenge, what would you say to them? Believe your voice is important. I think Emma sort of said it, it starts with us and this, um, I wouldn't say arrogance, but this self-assuredness that we have something important to give um, that's equally valuable and, and to, to say it, if, uh, to do it. Um, believe in yourself. 
Tony, you've mentioned the importance of the women in your life, both in your personal life and professional life. What does International Women's Day mean to you? Well, definitely a day to remind myself to thank all the amazing women that have helped me to be the one I am today, both as a person and, and as a coach. It's also a day to remind my daughter that find your passion and the resilience that Emma talked about and follow that and never take no for an answer. Let's keep going and follow your passion and your dream and, and, uh, and go for it. Um, but also hopefully inspire the people out there that might hesitate a little bit to maybe take the step into the game or into coaching that, you know what, look here, we have fantastic people right here that showing it, it can be done. So go for it. So choose to challenge. Is that your advice to, uh, to young women to get out there and give it a go? Yeah, for sure. As long as it, you, you know, challenge them to find that passion and resilience within themselves, because if they start there, then they can go out and do the other challenges and, and maybe take those hits that, for example, Emma said she got some hits on the, down the road, you know, and you need to be strong enough to go, walk through those as well. And Tony, as a, a leadership expert, really, uh, is that something you feel brings an, an enormous sense of responsibility for you? For sure. I mean, one part of my job being here now, first of all, I, I want to go there as well. Like you, you mentioned Mel being with me and, and kind of, you know, learn. She's not here to learn. She's here because she's learning me stuff. I'm learning of Mel. She's here because I need her. She has the competence and qualities to be here. Do I have a lot of responsibilities? Yes. But what I said when I talked about leadership and the next generation of leaders in Australia as well, it's not me leading. It's me being led as well. It's sharing that and, and growing together. Hopefully I can inspire and be a small part of it. Uh, but I'm just thankful to be a part of such an amazing organization and this uh, Legacy 23 program. Well, Mel, let's increase the pressure on you uh, even further. Uh, Emma Hayes, you know all about responsibility and, and leadership. Uh, what's your advice to young women if they want to choose to challenge in 2021? Well, you know, as I always say, you, you, don't, you don't have 30 seconds to waste. So don't. Um, don't look back. I think that's the important part. And when I think about International Women's Day, I think how more and more that becomes important in my own life as I age, but even more so because I have a young son. And for me, the, the, the gold standard is making sure we just normalize uh, this conversation so that by the time uh, he's sitting down listening to this in a few years time, he's not really even recognizing that there are any differences between the men and women's game, between the men and women's world that, that we're in a more equal society because we've been exposed to, as I said, there's been an equality of access to things. And that's that's the important thing is not to be decisive about it. It isn't to alienate, uh, it's to bring together people, but it's so critical now more than ever that we recognize the importance of the contribution scores of women have made in each other's lives. So realistically, when we reach true gender equality, we won't have an International Women's Day. Uh, for, for now, though, Emma, do you think it is uh, an important facet of life? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, re recognising uh, achievements across a range of different fields uh, and acknowledgement is always an important moment in anything. And, and I think that's something to celebrate. And I think it's something that the women that all of us represent, uh, that we're, we're including uh, them in the conversation because the scores of women that you guys are representing in the next few years are going to build a legacy that will last way beyond your time. And uh, that's the most inspiring thing about our job, the amount of kids that are going to walk around with Sammy Kerr shirts on and grow up either dreaming of being her or being one of you guys. That's that's what for me is, is showing little girls and women that the opportunities are there for us. We just need to, to shine a torch on it. Yeah, I mean, you've summed that up uh, beautifully, all four of you on this panel, such important roles in leadership, such responsibility looking to the future. And Sarah Walsh, I'll give you the last word as head of Women's World Cup Legacy at Football Australia, your role in the next few years is enormous and uh, has the chance to leave a lasting impact. How important is International Women's Day as part of that? 
Yeah, it's very important, Steph. Um, and I'm not doing it alone. It might sound like I am, but um, you know, we have an amazing group of people here at Football Australia. We obviously have an amazing uh, CEO and James Johnson who really understands this space. Um, we have some great people that are going to help bring this to life. Um, but look, I think International Women's Day for me, uh, look, I, I look forward to a day where, you know, we're not having to ask women to, you know, choose to challenge. Um, you know, I look forward to a day where, you know, women and girls can actually be themselves and, and you don't need resilience because, you know, if you look around at the women that, that really make it, there's a real, you know, toughness and, um, and you know what, yeah, I, obviously in the high performance arena, you need to have that kind of resilience and, and stamina to get through. But, you know, when I look at these teachers that we're going to target, I want them to just be themselves. And I don't think we have the environments or culture um, in sport, not just football um, yet. And so International Women's Day um, provides us the opportunity with the full spotlight to have these conversations. Um, and given that I work in this space every single day, um, I actually just use it to enjoy it. I, I usually meet a lot of women that I work across the industry with. We go to a breakfast and um, actually just enjoy the day. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll finish off with, I was scrolling through my social media um, just before, and um, there's, some, there's some young girls that are starting to think about what they're going to do for Female Football Week. Uh, we created Female Football Week because we thought International Women's Day wasn't long enough. Um, we thought maybe two weeks might be asking for a bit too much. So we landed on a week. Um, and I just absolutely love the conversation from these, you know, eight-year-old girls where they get the spotlight for the week. What are we going to do with it? Oh, and I just absolutely love that. So, you know, International Women's Day empowers women to use their voice. Um, and I do want to call out men here. Someone like Tony Gustafsson um, obviously, you know, completely understands this space. And I look forward to a world where our men's national teams have women in it and our, and our women's national teams have men in it as well because actually more diverse, inclusive environments will breed, I think, um, high-performing high performing teams. So... Um, you know, this is not about men and women. Um, I look forward to the day it's not gendered. Yeah, yeah. indeed, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. And I feel like listening to the four of you, uh, the world for girls and women in football is in very good hands indeed. I can't thank you enough for joining us this morning. Emma Hayes, all the best for what's coming up for the rest of the season for you. I hope life gets easier in the UK. And thank you so much for staying up late to join us. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, Tony Gustafsson, it's uh, your bedtime as well. Thank you so much. And we hope to meet you in person soon. Yeah, same here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stay safe, Mel Andrietta. It's uh, pretty cruisy up in Queensland as far as COVID is concerned, but uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in action with the Westville Matildas. Thanks for your time this morning. Go get some breakfast. Thank you, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah Walsh, as we said, big job ahead. Uh, thank you and your team for organising this session today and all the best for Legacy 23. Thank you, Steph. Thanks, everybody else, for joining. And thanks to all of you for joining us. I hope you got a lot out of that session. Happy International Women's Day, and we look forward to seeing you in and around football very shortly.